if you're uh, trying to work the math and see how long we'll have to wait, uh, looking at a comparison of the last three, uh, the kind of elapsed time uh, after the first appearance of the white smoke. So John Paul I, it was 1227, and then uh, we learned his name 1252. Uh, that would lead to John Paul II uh, uh, in rapid succession. 1222 to 117, and then of course Cardinal uh, Ratzinger, Pope Benedict, 1149 to 1243. So uh, we're uh, uh, nearing the ballpark here uh, soon, and that would also be borne out by the uh, movement of the bands, color guards, guards who will fill a large portion of the open plaza in front of the building before we're uh, done here. Uh, elements of uh, the Italian armed forces by branch. Um, and George Weigel, the, uh, uh, explain a little bit more behind the scenes. There's a great distance to be traveled, first of all, from the Sistine uh, Chapel, all of it slow pace, ceremonial, and then what we would call in America a kind of a robing room. That's right, Brian. Uh, from the Sistine Chapel, the new pope, after he formally accepts his election and announces to his brother cardinals the name by which he chooses to be known, goes into what is called uh, traditionally the Room of Tears, where three possible white vestments, white cassocks have been prepared, small, medium, and large. Uh, he'll be vested uh, in that room. He will receive, as Father Barron said a moment ago, uh, gestures of greeting from his brother cardinals. John Paul II changed that ritual. The Pope used to sit down to receive the cardinals who had just elected him. John Paul II brushed the chair aside and said, I receive my brother's standing. After that's completed, the Pope will go to the Pauline Chapel, where this whole uh, dramatic process began yesterday. Uh, for a moment of prayer before the Blessed Sacrament, surrounded by marvelous frescoes of Peter and Paul, not frescoes, paintings, by Michelangelo, two of the last great works of his life. And then it's really not that long a walk from the Pauline Chapel to uh, this loggia, this balcony that we see uh, here. That is a balcony off what is known as the Hall of Benedictions. It sits atop the narthex or the vestibule of St. Peter's Basilica. It's one of the larger audience halls uh, in the Vatican. Uh, Cardinal Jean-Louis Touran of France, a longtime uh, papal diplomat, uh, will come out on the balcony on the central loggia. And in his role as the senior member of the order of deacons among the cardinals, will announce that there is news of great joy, a new pope, uh, Cardinal X, who has chosen to call himself Y. And then the new pope will come out uh, fairly shortly uh, after that, and then this plaza will simply explode at that point. And George, uh, just one uh, question. Why would a, uh, uh, an interior space associated with news of great joy to the church be known uh, as the Room of Tears? Well, the, the Room of Tears is right off of the Sistine Chapel, and I think it's called that simply because it's in that room that it perhaps first hits a man what an extraordinary burden he's just taken on. And that's something that I think we all need to be aware of. This is not like a politician rising to the top of his profession or a Super Bowl winning quarterback. This is a man who has just taken on the responsibility of spiritual fatherhood for 1.2 billion Catholics around the world, the awesome responsibility of being a kind of moral reference point for the entire planet, a man who is going to every day for the rest of his life hear about the sorrows of the world in macrocosm from his representatives around the world, and who will every day for the rest of his life receive prayer requests from ordinary people around the world, uh, and he will learn the sorrows of the world in intimate microcosm. It takes a special depth of faith uh, to be able to bear that burden, 
and no one should be surprised that a man becoming to come, beginning to come to grips with what he's just agreed to do should shed a few tears. Waves of excitement we can hear from here going through the crowd. Uh, the next musical selection is starting as you saw the uh, uh, head of the guards uh, reviewing his troops. Those just joining us, it was uh, seven minutes after the hour when those of us who had our attention fixed all day long on a chimney pipe above the Sistine Chapel were rewarded with uh, not just a puff of white smoke, but uh, billows of it as it came out in healthy amounts. Uh, to a rain-soaked crowd, the cheers went up instantly when it was apparent that a new pope had been elected by the 115 eligible cardinals locked inside, away from any outside world influences. Uh, no media, no contact with the outside world as they were prepared to remain for however many days uh, this took. And now, uh, thankfully, we're told by our team there, the precipitation has let up a bit. Uh, and uh, it's becoming a uh, beautiful night as the dinner hour arrives in Rome. And the true excitement is coming, along with several thousand more people who are no doubt on foot and in cars, hopeful that they can get there in time to at least catch a glimpse of one of the big screen TVs set up, but certainly to experience it. Uh, we see a few American flags above the crowd. Lester Holt, you're um, uh, last night on NBC Nightly News, you spent some time with some American Catholics there, as has Ann Thompson over the uh, past few days. Always hard to call out percentages, but always a healthy group of them. Always a healthy group. It's spring break, of course, for a lot of schools. A lot of families uh, from the United States have been here. Uh, most of these trips planned long before they knew there was going to be a vacancy of the Holy See. They find themselves in Rome at the Vatican at this uh, historic moment, uh, never knowing that history would be on their, their travel itinerary. Uh, a lot of folks we spoke to down there talking about their hopes and wishes for a new pope. Some openly talked about perhaps the possibility of an American pope. Uh, a lot of them talked about the, the wish for their church to be perhaps more inclusive and, and perhaps embrace more of the modern world, right? Uh, Lester, we're going to uh, pause here in just a moment to welcome even more of our NBC stations. Uh, on to the network as we all uh, together await the identity of the new pope. And with that, we welcome the NBC stations just joining us. Uh, we received word uh, within this past hour, and that was confirmed by uh, billows of white smoke from the chimney atop the Sistine Chapel. Cardinals have indeed elected a new pope uh, to head the Catholic Church. Our team has been following all of it. We are awaiting first word, first glimpse from the balcony at the Basilica. Ann Thompson is in the square below. And Ann, this is, um, this is when uh, uh, nervous anticipation reaches its height. It really is, Brian. There's just an electricity down here in the square. We can hear people shouting, Viva il Papa, um, in anticipation of them coming. People are standing on each other's shoulders, trying to get a glimpse, trying to see. But you know, as I'm watching this, and one of the things that we have heard over and over again as we spent the last month in Rome, one of the things that the new Pope must do is meet Catholics where they're at. He must find a way to connect them, to bring the message of the church and have it make, have relevance in their everyday lives. And among the American cardinals, they've really talked about the need to communicate, to get out there, and not just from the pulpit, but don't be afraid to be on Twitter, don't be afraid to be on Facebook, don't be afraid to have a blog. And again, you can hear these chants again, Viva il Papa, Viva il Papa coming up again as they wait for those doors to open at the uh, Loja of the Blessings, the balcony there in the center of the Basilica, where we will first hear the name of the new pope. Brian? Ann Thompson uh, with us uh, from what has to be the most exciting place on earth right now, <laughs> and that is the square with a couple hundred thousand of her closest <laughs> friends. Above the square, uh, our broadcast team remains, and we are 
Uh, so happy to be joined uh, here in the studio by a man uh, we know well, Cardinal Edward Michael Egan. Let's use the full name on this day. Uh, Cardinal, uh, because of, well, we, we have to be blunt about this, because of your age, over 80, you could not be a voting member today. That's exactly right, Brian. Uh, so that is to our benefit because we get to have you here in New York uh, commenting on this. Uh, what, uh, tell us about your thoughts in the few minutes you've, uh, you've known we have a new pope. Well, we still don't know the name, but uh, Brian and I went to uh, Rome on February 26th. On the 28th, I said goodbye to Pope Benedict XVI, and I could mention, Brian, that he asked me to thank New York for the most wonderful visit he had in his entire tenure as Holy Father, right here in 2008. And so I guess I have a chance to do that on NBC. And then I stayed and uh, attended all sorts of meetings with cardinals of various countries, and then even two of the congregaciones, as they say, those two formal meetings where we all get up and say what we want. And then when uh, I had finished the second day, I decided to get back to New York and uh, to see the rest of it on NBC TV. But uh, my feelings are very much as they were years ago when I was here uh, telling you about the uh, election of Pope Benedict XVI. For me, this is primarily a matter of religion primarily a matter of faith. I see this as the naming of the Bishop of Rome. And because he's the Bishop of Rome and the successor of St. Peter, he is what we call the Vicar of Christ. And he is to be a great Bishop of Rome, and I know that he will be. And I'm confident that the Lord has seen to it that we have a leader now who will uh, give us the kind of guidance and support that we're all looking for. I don't know the name, but as soon as we find out, I'll tell you what I know about him, Brian. And uh, I'm happy to say that I think I know to say hello in the name of about 60% of the Cardinals. Because I lived in Rome, as you know, so long, and worked in the Curia mm -hmm. for 14 years, taught over there and so forth. And Brian, believe it or not, I actually taught five of these cardinals at some point in their seminary or post-seminary education. So I really feel like the old man of the, of the sea, you know. <laughs> and I was particularly delighted when uh, I was leaving, uh, the Cardinal Archbishop of Bombay came up to me and he said, you know, did I ever thank you for the course you gave me concerning matrimony at the Gregorian? I said, no. People usually didn't thank me for that course, <laughs> but I said, I welcome your thanks. And that was uh, the Cardinal Archbishop of Bombay and a wonderful man. And so as I say, I know many of these very well and some of them I even had in the classroom. Well, Your Eminence, I hear, I hear, um, I, I hear what you're saying about the Vicar of Christ, which is uh, first and foremost the title of this uh, man whose identity we're about to learn. But also, uh, in your standards for who this must be, this has to be a manager, this has to be a preacher, this has to be a, a healer, a consoler, so many job titles that fall underneath Vicar of Christ. Brian, you should be giving this uh, uh, <laughs> statement rather than I. Well, I'll tell you, Brian, I think he has to have five qualities. The first one is he has to be a man of prayer who loves leading public prayer and privately pray, prays with joy and fulfillment. Secondly, it has to be a man who repeats the gospel message in an uncomplicated manner. Mm -hmm. The gospel isn't that complicated. The Sermon on, Sermon on the Mount is rather easy to get on first bounce. Eh? I think he has to be one who in an uncomplicated manner announces the gospel and takes great joy in the beauty and power of it. Then I think he has to be a leader who will lead in the great questions of our day. And I would identify them as justice, compassion, and peace. He has to give guidance in all of those. And fourth, you notice I put it fourth, I think you put it first. We Italians, Brian, after 23 years, I. In Rome, I can say we Italians. We would say, Devi sapere governare. He has to know how to govern. He has to know how to rule, how to administrate, how to get people doing things in an orderly fashion.